Thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you today. Um, I'd like to talk to you um, a little, on a little bit of a different approach here in um, some of the presenters today and also yesterday mentioned that a central database or electronic identification of animals is a tool and it's part of a suite of tools to make traceability a successful operation. And what I would like to, to do today is perhaps take a small step backwards uh, away from central databases and just show how this data can be used rather than simply talk about data but actually give you a practical application. And I thought what I would do was actually take you through a disease outbreak that we have experienced in Victoria and you can join me as we attack this disease outbreak. So the, the slides I'm going to show you are from an actual disease outbreak and how we attacked it using the tools that we've built. What I will do is just start off with a very, very brief summary of the Australian system so you can understand how we can do what we're about to do together. But uh, we'll do this quickly so we can spend more time on the tools around uh, what can be done with the electronic identification. So this is the Australian system. I won't, I won't read you the entire slide, but um, we started off in 1999 uh, and then um, mandatory um, situation started incurring in on 2002. We also, I, th and I think this is a critical, critical element of any form of system is you really need to ensure that you understand why you are identifying your cattle or whatever species you are identifying. I think sometimes there is a risk that um, we can have industry sectors believing that the identification of animals um, are for a certain reason and if you get them in all into one room you'll find out that everybody's identifying the cattle for different reasons. So it's important that there is a cohesive um, decision on why, uh, in, in Australia's situation, in what I have before you, as to why cattle uh, were identified. And these were the decisions that we unanimously agreed on. The foundation in, in Australia, and I would encourage this, this concept right across the board, the foundation for any, and I really emphasise this, for any identification system is about location. You can't move something from a person. Okay, when you, we need to think strategically, we need to think in the big picture. If you have a disease outbreak, you can't say that this animal has moved from Eric to Ken. Okay, we need to know the geographical location. If we think of the disease being, for example, an airborne contagion, so we know that these cattle, as they breathe, are transmitting that disease. Knowing who owned the animal does not help us does not help us at all. We need to know the geographic location of that animal so we can work out what animals are infected. So the property identification code system for us was paramount and as you can see I argue that it is the foundation of an identification system because again it's the purpose of identifying. We are identifying an animal from this location and it has gone to another location. I can't compete with India whatsoever when it comes to statistics so um, yeah, I couldn't believe those figures. <laughs> Especially when he said the population of the farmers. Uh, he said 20 million farmers were in India. That's the population of my country. So that's impressive. So PICs are linked to geographical location. So I'm going to emphasize this a little bit. So you, as you can see here, this is a property identification code. There it is on just simply a PowerPoint. But you can see the satellite image of that same parcel of land there. The tags, when tags are issued, and I apologise to the non allflex tag entities up the back, please forgive me, it is an allflex tag. We have many tag suppliers, and as soon as I put, I didn't know which one to choose, so I chose the one that I thought would cause Klaus the most angst. So, <laughs> but the tags are linked to geographical locations. When we issue the tags out, they're sent to a property identification code because then we know that right from the very moment the tag is purchased, it is at this location. There's our current Victorian farms. Okay, so each purple dot, if you can count them while I've got this slide up, I'll give you a chocolate bar at the end. But um, these are the current pr property identification codes registered in Victoria. So if you own one animal, or if you own 100,000 animals, you must have a property identification code. It's the law. Uh, if you do not have a property identification code, you cannot own livestock. And then with the movements, as has been uh, demonstrated by the presenters before me, probably far more adequately than I could do, um, with the, the way the movement of the cattle is, when cattle move, they are moved from a location to another location, 
and they're all recorded on that central database um, down the bottom right corner there. So that's, it's, I'm trying to keep it very simple here because that's exactly how the transactions occur. It is literally that simple. You put in a from location, you put in a to location, you include the tag numbers, and you upload it to the central database. That can be done via a mobile phone, it can be done via the internet, it can be done via paper if you really feel that way inclined and you like your pencil, um, but that's how it's, how it's conducted. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's go on to disease outbreak. And the disease I'm giving you today is the last disease I was um, involved with. So my role in the government is a, um, basically a data specialist where I would uh, review the particular animal that's been infected and then I provide data to the officers to explain to them um, what, uh, where the disease is spreading. And uh, I think the common term for someone like myself is a computer nerd. So here we go, we've got a, um, a disease outbreak and we're going to use these tools. So the tools that we've got in front of us, um, we've got an animal disease management information system, just a very big long word for a contact database. Okay, so if you've got a property, these are the address details. An epidemiology system, okay, which talks about the disease itself. Okay, and then uh, you can read all that, but they're the systems that we have built, we have used and what we're going to use right now to, to trace this disease. As soon as we get an infection, uh, or, a, or a definite infection, we immediately um, log that property identification code with an infected status. Now the reason we do that is that status then is instantly uploaded to the central database, and every entity that connects to that database, Saliard or Abattoir, receives that status notification instantly. So that way if an infected property is still selling cattle or has sold cattle, those entities, especially abattoirs, it's critical, get that information so they can react quickly. It's, it's very, very disappointing and difficult for abattoirs to find out that an animal that they killed yesterday uh, needs to be quarantined. It's too late. Then you're talking about massive costs on the abattoir, sometimes the trucking companies and shipping companies. What I do then is, based on that property identification code, I then ask the database to give me all the animals registered uh, to that property. So there's the registration. And you'll notice that little circle I've got there. Can you see the black circle? Because of the, the, the wind direction on this particular day, that is the circle based on the wind speed, and, and the wind speed on this particular day was 10 knots. In, in that circle would have been infected by this animal. So I need to know all the animals within that circle, where are they? And I also need to know the address details of those people because we need to contact them, we need to quarantine them, we need to lock this down. As fast as I am speaking is how fast this occurs. Okay, because remember, we, it's, it, it's all about the speed of reaction. So we now have the address details, we have the phone numbers, we can straight away get on the phone, we can also send quarantine officers in place, occasionally utilise resources like the police, just to help out and get that reaction in there. And for the farmers, this is very important for them, because this is what allows us to get back into production as quickly as possible. The faster we can control it, the faster we can respond and react, the faster we can get going again. Then we need to build relationships, and I apologise to any politicians here, but we found it very difficult explaining data to politicians in a way that made sense. So we decided to go to pictures. And um, so what we do here is we drew up a picture of the relationship between the animals and the farms. Because we said, okay, look, this is the uh, suspect animal and the relationship between that animal and the other infected animals looks like that. Now, that's a disease outbreak. So straight away, one animal, these are the number of animals that were infected. Now, this is a great tool for people like our chairman, the, um, the chief veterinary officers, because they can look at that and they can demonstrate then the seriousness of a disease in one single slide. You show that slide on any news channel and they can understand why this is serious. These are the number of animals that are infected. In this particular disease outbreak, the anthrax animals, there were 80 of them. The number of cattle they infected was 88,000. 88,000. With this system that we're talking about here, the trace, all these details, the whole thing was completed and finished within two hours of the first response being found. Two hours. Now, it's taken a long time to get to that point. But that's the response time that we need because in, in, in Australia, especially in Victoria, 80% of our cattle go through sale yards. 
So a massive group of cattle, they come in, they get sold, and they go into multiple different locations. What we need to do then is also drop quarantine zones. Now again, as fast as we are talking is exactly how fast it occurs. So there you can see our red are our infected properties, our orange, dangerous contact, haven't confirmed any cases yet. Okay, we've got our exclusion zones, our restricted areas where no cattle can come in or come out. This is critical information. And again, you can see how the national, the central database is the back end to all of this information. So this is just a tool that you can use with the information that you collect, if that makes sense. And I really strongly believe that putting this into a picture format makes things so much easier for people. When you're trying to explain, especially when you've got a number of um, officers in the room and you're trying to explain, look, we need to quarantine rapidly, we need to be doing this, we need to be doing that, putting up a picture in front of them makes sense. If I threw heaps and heaps of data up there, they've got to try and read it, they've got to try and work out which part is particular to them. A picture speaks a thousand words. That picture says five, so I better hurry up. So here's, for example, one sale on the July the 18th, 2014. That's where the cattle went. And you can see when it comes to quarantine measurements, if that infected animal had gone into Ballarat sale yards on that day, you can see the level of quarantines that would have to be put in place, especially when you think about road transport. That's one of the key areas that we're looking at now is how do we work out which direction the cattle trucks have gone because there's a high risk area of those cattle movements. So I'll finish off with these key elements. What makes up a good identification system? We do need a central database, absolutely. Now again, I can't compete with you. But, uh, on average, we do 120,000 cattle movements a day uh, and 99.5% of these are electronic. Electronic, not visual. Now you tell me whether that's one, two, three, or ABC. I, I deal with this constantly, constantly, with people handwriting out the electronic RFID numbers. It's, it's a proven fact that 20% of visual transcriptions will be inaccurate, and, and it's been proven over and over again. Here's another example of these visual tags collected at an abattoir. If you can read them, you're better than I am, but you can see our concern with, um, with these type of devices and bearing in mind that the abattoir that's killing these sheep uh, are killing them one every three to four seconds. Now, if you can read a tag one every three to four seconds again, you're an incredible person. You need to have minimum standards. Minimum standards are critical, set a minimum standard and then stick to it. So this discussion I think we've had today has been excellent. Appropriate equipment. Uh, there's nothing worse than, I've seen it time and time again, someone taking in a small uh, wand reader into a sale yard and then wondering why their arm got broken. Use equipment that's appropriate um, to the environment that you're reading in. And talk to the reader manufacturers. We've, we're lucky to have so many manufacturers with us today. Talk to them. Tell them your situation. They also want to ensure that the readers that you're using are appropriate to your situation. Another thing you need is leadership. Okay? And, and I think this is a critical component. So many times we can, we can move and bend um, to what people think that they want. But the problem is, is oftentimes where they need to be is not necessarily where they want to be. And I leave that with you. I won't say too much more on that. But it's a critical decision for you. And there's still challenges for us. One of them is how to get this bull out of this trailer. But we, we still face ongoing challenges. Probably one of our biggest challenges right now is how to continue marketing electronic identification as farmers have got older and retired. The younger generation comes in and they don't understand why we do what we do. The other thing that we've done too is what you've just seen now in this presentation, we've made commercially available. I saw one of the posters had the LTAT symbol on their poster. So all these tools that we've built, we've made commercially available so any country in the world can have access to what we've done because we've done a lot of blood, sweat and tears in this and we've thought, well, why keep it to ourselves and, and it's now commercially available for people to use as well so you can plug it on top. That's my presentation. Um, Thank you. Uh, we don't electronically tag these.